Good evening. The first song tonight will be number 529. 529. We're singing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule there alone. The love of God within the heart of kindliness and warmth is heart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God goes like a flame. Through endless years, it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose his glory till we see him face to face. Let me get it up a little bit. Since the Son of God came down with his love our lives to crown, he with us would remain. Greater love there could not be. Jesus died for you and me. In our hearts he would reign. The love of God within the heart. The love of God flows like a flame. Through endless years, it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose his glory till we see him face to face. While his love burns through and bright, we are walking in the light. He has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep some soul from his God. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow. Jesus in his tender mercy, if the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God was like a flame. Through in the years, it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose his glory till we see him face. Psalm before the permanent 144. 144. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to
Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this wonderful Lord's Day. Dear Father, thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. Dear Father, please be with the families in Oklahoma that went through such a tragedy this week. Dear Father, please bless them, especially the ones that lost loved ones. Please comfort them. Dear Father, please be with the ones that lost their homes and help them to restore these homes back to their the way they were. Dear Father, thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Dear Father, thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Dear Father, please help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ just as Christ loved the church. Dear Father, thank you so much for the ones that are here tonight. Dear Father, please be with the ones that aren't here, whether they be traveling or just not here. Dear Father, please be with the ones that are not here because they've fallen away, that we could say something to them that will help bring them back to you. Dear Father, thank you for letting us come here tonight to open up your inspired word and study from it. Dear Father, please guide, guard, and direct us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 379. 379. Why did the Savior... I'm sorry, got the wrong tune. Why did the Savior heavenly and come to earth below, where men his grace would not receive, because he loved me so? Mark number 514, we're saying this as an imitation hymn after the lesson. 514. Now turn to number 266. If you would, please stand. 266. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. Wonder. 
wonderful story of love. Jesus provides the best. Wonderful story of love for all the pure and blessed. Rest in those mansions above us with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus. Wonderful story. We, we honored our graduates this morning and kind of, I guess you might say, continuing with that theme, we'll look at something this evening that, you know, again, it's one of those things that I sort of thought about it as this being a, a special day to honor Lauren and Jake for their accomplishments, but also something that, you know, applies no matter what station we're in in our lives. Uh, let me read this to you, and I'll put it on the screen so you can read this with me. The pencil maker, it's called the parable of the pencil, and I, I, I could not find an author for it. But the pencil maker took the pencil aside just before putting him into the box. There are six things you need to know, he told the pencil, before I send you out into the world. Always remember them and never forget, and you will become the best pencil you can be. And then here are those six things. One, you will be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. Two, you will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you'll need it to become a better pencil. Three, you will be able to correct any mistakes you might make. Four, the most important part of you will always be what's inside. Five, on every surface you are used on, you must leave your mark. Six, no matter what the condition, you must continue to write. The pencil understood and promised to remember and went into the box with purpose in its heart. And for the few minutes this evening, I want to uh, propose to each of us that we swap places with the pencil. Put yourself in there and let's look at these tips from the pencil maker and see how we can apply them to our lives. Again, there's a certain special application to folks uh, who are graduating or entering some kind of new phase of life but there's an application here for each and every one of us. First, as we just noticed, you'll be able to do great things, but only if you place yourself, uh, allow yourself to be held in someone's hands. Psalm 95, if you have your Bible, you may want to turn there. I want to read a few verses from Psalm 95. And notice something here with, with Israel really the exact opposite of this point. One of the songs that we sing, uh, you know, I sometimes use the, the term camp songs, and I, I hope you all understand what I'm talking about when I use that expression. I don't, I don't particularly like that expression just because if it's a song of praise, then it's a song of praise, whether we sing it at camp or in worship or wherever it may be. Sometimes we, it almost sounds like there are two different uh, categories of songs, but... Uh, in fact, some of the songs that we call camp songs are direct quotations from Scripture. But uh, I, I think everybody understands I use that accommodatively. Uh, do we sing this at, at uh, Inagahi, Johnny? The, uh, the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods? Don't know that? Okay. Okay. So it's, it's, some of these words are quoted in one of the songs that we often sing at camp. Uh, but he begins, O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Watch it, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture 
and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. This was the Jews' problem in a nutshell here in Psalm 95. They did not place themselves in the hands of Almighty God. I mean, read your Old Testament and you see it time and time and time again. And even sometimes righteous kings in Judah's history, you know, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there were no righteous kings. But there were some in Judah who were righteous. But even many times you see a righteous king and he gets into trouble and what does he do? He sends money to Egypt or to Assyria or somebody saying, hey, help me, instead of placing the nation in the hands of Almighty God. Now, if you want the opposite of that, a good righteous king who did place himself and the nation in God's hands was Hezekiah. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, has taken over the north. He's carried them off into captivity, the northern kingdom of Israel. He's, uh, he's besieged Jerusalem and was about to take it. And Hezekiah, he doesn't send money to, Assyria, or to Egypt or whomever it may be. He says, God, please help us. We're in your hands. We're placing ourselves in your hands. And, of course, God sent an angel who destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, and they left, and they went back the way that they came, and they did not conquer the city of Jerusalem. But Israel, the Jews, by and large, they did not place themselves in the master's hand, and that's, that was their mistake. It, it, it reminds me, as far as the outcome, because God says to them, and he says to us today too, if that's what you want, I give you that choice. If that's what you want, you will get it. And I, I say that reminds me of, there's a, there's a movie Cool Hand Luke, it's an old movie, and I, I haven't seen it in a long, long time, but um, I hope I don't spoil it for anybody that's never seen the movie, but there's this fella, Luke, and he gets the nickname Cool Hand Luke, but he's bent on escaping from prison, and he's there in prison, and over and over again he escapes, they put him in the hole, they beat him, and he just, time and time again, well, there's the one scene in the movie that's kind of, if, if people don't recognize anything else from the movie, they recognize that one scene where the warden says, you know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. It, you know, it's like you're not getting it. And, and sometimes I feel like in, in, a, in a sense, in a paraphrased way, that's what God is saying to Israel and to me sometimes, is that we've got a failure to communicate here. You're not getting it. And, of course, the warden goes on and says, some men you just can't reach. And, and he says, you get what we had here last week, which was talking about the, uh, the escaping and, and then catching him and beating him up. And he says, which is the way he wants it? Well, he gets it. And God says to us, he said it to Israel in so many words, but it continues to remain true today. God says, I am the Almighty. If you choose to place yourself in my hands, great things can be accomplished. But if you don't, if you choose not to, if you choose to go your own way, if that's what you want, well, you get it. And we suffer the consequences so many times when we do that. But just like the pencil, we can accomplish great things, but only if we place ourselves in the master's hands. The Jews didn't do that, and quite honestly, so often in our own lives, we don't do that. But you think about a pencil. What good is a pencil if you just place it down on a surface? It's not doing any good. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. And what happens so many times with folks, especially even sometimes members of the Lord's church? They're just sitting there. Why? Because they are not putting themselves in the hands of the master. Look at a few other verses here. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He's the shepherd. We are the sheep, not, not vice versa. It's not the other way around. Compare that to Paul's statement in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his, Christ's, workmanship or God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's, that's the purpose that he designed us for. When we place ourselves in his hands, he can do great things with us and he will do great things. A couple other verses that come to mind, Isaiah 29, 16, Isaiah makes this statement, surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? And yet, Isaiah is saying that's what God's people were doing so often. 
It's like the potter saying to the clay, or the clay saying to the potter, hey, what are you doing? I don't like what you're making. Well, that would never happen in nature. And yet here were God's own people, his creation, that many times question him instead of placing themselves in his hands. Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or of thy work he hath no hands. He says, you know, let the clay strive with the clay. You can strive with one another, but don't strive with God. That's a losing battle. We need to be putting ourselves in God's hands and letting him do great things with us. Let's turn to another passage here. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 beginning. And I, I want to notice this. And I think I mentioned this in a Bible class not, not too long ago. Sometimes this passage gets quoted, and, and I think we, if we're not careful, we can take it out of context and apply it to today. There, there certainly are situations where it would apply today. But sometimes I, I've heard it used as kind of a blanket statement. Isaiah 64 and begin at verse 6, and this is the verse that so often is that I hear quoted. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. I, I've heard people say all, to, all the time, and, and what they're talking about is how we don't deserve salvation. And the point is correct. It's just, I, I, and I'll tell you why I don't necessarily like using this verse without at least some qualification. But the point is that, you know, we could do good works all day long, but without God's grace, it's all as filthy rags. It's all useless because without God's grace, we can't take away sin. And we mentioned that this morning. Only the blood of Christ can do that. But, you know, he goes on and says, verse 7, There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us. Now watch it. Because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou our potter. We are all the work of thy hand. Isaiah says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags because we remain in sin. But the reason I have the cross reference there to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 21 is because when I put myself in the hands of God, my righteousness is not, are not as filthy rags. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, but if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, I, that statement doesn't apply to me if I'm a faithful Christian. And that doesn't mean I'm sinless. But if I'm faithfully striving to live as God would have me to live, the statement, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, doesn't apply. Because if I'm in Christ, I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are are become new. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, I love that verse as well. It's just a few verses down. He says, For he, hath, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, a sin offering, in other words, for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, if I'm in Christ, and, and we've noticed before Galatians 3.27, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and it's it's the same word in the Greek. It's the idea of if, if, if you were to say, I put on a coat or I put on a garment, you would use that same word. You've clothed yourself with Christ. And so God doesn't look at me and see all the mistakes that I've made. They're washed away by the blood of the Lamb. When I place myself in the Master's hand, I'm the righteousness of God in Him. And what a blessing that is. But when I take myself out of the master's hands, I'm about as useful as a pencil that's just laying there doing nothing. You can accomplish great things, but only if you place yourself in the hands of Almighty God. Let's notice a second, like with the pencil, you will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you need that to become better. Several verses come to mind here. Job 5:17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening, of the Almighty. Psalm 119, verse 67, David says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. He goes on in verse 71 and says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now, we could talk about this, this painful sharpening from the sense of life circumstances getting on us 
uh, and getting us down and causing us trials and suffering. But for time's sake, we're just looking at this from the standpoint of the chastening of God. And, and this chastening, generally speaking, and I, I, we know it's not some kind of miraculous thing, but there is a chastening that we do know about that comes through the Word of God. You know, sometimes you hear a sermon, I've been there, and you think, boy, that one, that one really got me. And, and sometimes people even hear a sermon and get upset and get angry. And, and sometimes they even want to lash out at the preacher when what is happening is they're being chastened by the Lord. They know there's something there that they need to work on, something that they need to make right in their lives. But instead of making that necessary correction to self, I get upset with the preacher or I get upset with the message. And, and that happens sometimes. Sometimes people will get upset in the sense of uh, being, becoming very emotional and, and crying. And, you know, they're, they're pricked in the heart is the way that Acts chapter 2 says it. And they do something about it. But we're chastened many times through the word of God. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 11 and 12, he says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. If God loves us, he corrects us. And then Hebrews 12, verse 6, basically quotes from that passage, For whom the Lord uh, loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. So you're going to experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you need that to become better. And so when I hear a sermon, and that's one of the great things uh, about a preacher being able to attend uh, lectureships and workshops and, and sometimes even having guest speakers here, to be able to sit and listen because, you know, sometimes just because a fellow is a preacher doesn't mean he doesn't need to hear a sermon from time to time. And all of us from time to time are going to be chastened by the Lord through the preaching of the gospel. I need that, though, to become better. Revelation 3.19, very simply, Jesus himself says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What kind of father would not ever chasten or rebuke a child that was being disobedient, rebellious, uh, unruly. We would say, well, that, that parent doesn't have much love for his child if he doesn't do that. Well, what about God? God loves his children. And sometimes I, I hear a sermon. Sometimes I may just be reading the Bible. I mean, there are times in my own personal Bible study that I read something and it convicts me. And I know, you know what, I, I've got to work on that. I've got to make a change in that area. I need to do better. I need to stop doing something, start doing something. But understand that, that it sometimes is painful. That's just the nature of it. But it helps us to become a better servant of God. I've told you before about the fellow in the congregation where I used to preach way down in South Alabama. He was a big old burly man. And he, uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, he wasn't all that terribly tall, but he, was just, he looked like he was just a bodybuilder type fellow, huge. But he come out one day. After I'd preached a sermon, I don't even remember what the sermon was, but he came out and he was, he was kind of walking funny. And I said, I said, Billy, what's wrong with you? And he said, man, he said, next time you got to give me some warning so I can wear my steel toe boots. <laughs> and uh, he was saying that the sermon stepped on his toes, but he was saying, you know what, I needed that. And there are times when we're going to experience some sharpening from the Lord, but we need that to become better. Again, think of it in terms of a pencil. What good is a pencil if it never gets sharpened? Eventually, that thing's going to have to be sharpened or it's useless. So you'll experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you need that to become better. Let's notice third, you'll be able to correct any mistakes that you might make. Hebrews 8, 12, and 10, 17 just says simply, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God offers the best eraser you can possibly get. Now, you know, sometimes if you ever... Sometimes I write too hard on paper, and even with a pencil, I go to erase it, and you know, there's still a mark there. I can still see a little bit of that that I wrote. I can't get it erased all the way, but God's eraser doesn't do that. God's eraser makes everything completely pristine, new. We already noticed 2 Corinthians 5, 17. His eraser takes away all mistakes. He says, their sins, their iniquities, will I remember no more. I may have made some big mistakes in my life. You may have made some big mistakes in your life. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, they can be corrected. They can be washed away. When we come to God, we believe in Jesus. We often talk about the plan of salvation. It's, it's more than just a, a checklist of things to do, but it's part of becoming a disciple of Jesus. I believe that he is God's son. I turn away from sin and selfishness and give my life to him, confess his name as Lord, and then baptism is that eraser of God wherein he takes away my sins. He erases them. 
Acts 2.38, they cried out, you know, on the day of Pentecost, what shall we do? In verse 37, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22.16, Saul of Tarsus was told, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away, taking away, erasing, if you will, in this context, your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Baptism is God's eraser. Now, it's great to believe in Jesus. It's necessary. It's great to repent and turn away from sins and say, I'm giving my life to God. And it's great to confess him as Lord. But until I apply that eraser, the sins are still there. You know, I can make a mistake on paper as I'm writing, and I, I meant to bring a pencil up here with me, and I didn't, but I, I feel like I'm just uh, lost without it. But, uh, you know, I, I may make a mistake on a piece of paper, and, I, you know, I need to erase that. And I may say in my mind, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like how that sentence is written, or I, I shouldn't have written that. I'm, gonna, I'm going to correct that mistake. Maybe I misspelled a word. I'm going to correct that mistake. I believe that I've misspelled the word. I, I'm, I'm in my mind, I've made the decision. I'm going to correct that mistake. I may even tell somebody, you know what, I misspelled that word. I need to correct that. But what, all, what, what good is that until I take the eraser and apply it? Well, baptism is God's eraser. That's where we apply the blood of Christ and our sins are erased, washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8 shows us the need to be faithful. You know, Paul at the end of his life, <clears throat> in other words, it's not just becoming a Christian, it's living a life that is faithful. And you know the words of Paul. He says, I'm now ready to be offered the time my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love is appearing. I've got to be faithful unto death. For the Christian, there's also an eraser that God uses. That is 1 John 1, verses 7 and 9. 1 John 1, 7 and 9, verse 7, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. And then he goes on in verse 9 and says, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, when, I'm, when I make a mistake as a Christian, I don't, I don't go through the plan of salvation as far as uh, con making the confession before witnesses and uh, being baptized into Christ again, but I repent of that sin. It's a change of mind, and it, of course, leads to a change of action. I confess it as widely as is known, and then I pray to God for forgiveness, and, and many times we pray on behalf of of a brother or sister who has come and acknowledged some type of need of prayer, need of forgiveness. That's God's eraser for the Christian. Acts 26, verse 20, toward the end of that verse, Paul is speaking there, and he talks about doing uh, people who should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Works fitting, we might say, or works uh, that show repentance. Well, it's the idea of correcting mistakes when you're able. Now, you, you can't always go back and correct every mistake. But where we can, we certainly want to do that. Reminds us of Luke 19 and verse 8, where this man named Zacchaeus is talking to Jesus there. And toward the end of that verse, he says, If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. He says, I'm going to correct these mistakes that I've made. But thanks be to God that like the pencil, you can correct the mistakes that you make. As long as you've got breath and, and sanity an opportunity here on this earth, you can correct those mistakes. But what good is it if you don't apply the eraser? Notice number four, the most important part of you will always be what's on the inside. You know 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, where, <clears throat> where uh, God is speaking to Samuel there, and he says, uh, he says, you know, don't, I haven't chosen this one. You know, Samuel wanted to choose every one of David's brothers, basically, except for David because they were taller or stronger or maybe more handsome or whatever. And, but God says, you know, the Lord doesn't look as man looks. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God looks at our hearts. That's how he determines who is righteous, who is not right, who is in sin, or who is saved. Colossians 2, 11 and 12, he, notice what he says here. And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands... Why without hands? Because it's an inward thing. And he goes on in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, 
wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. It's an inward transformation. It's an inward change. And that's why Paul says, Romans 2, 29, for he is a Jew which is one inwardly. He's a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is not of the heart, or circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. And so, you know, God doesn't have a special physical nation of people today. We often talk about this, and the misunderstanding that many people in the world have today, thinking that the Jews are, are some kind of special people of God, physical Jews. But spiritual Israel is God's people today. The most important part is what's on the inside. And so God says the circumcision that happens now is not a physical circumcision. It is a spiritual circumcision of the heart that God performs. And that's performed, he says in Colossians 2.12, in the act of baptism. That's the operation of God. We are baptized into Christ. It's a passive act. You know, when I believe, that's active. I must believe on Jesus Christ. When I repent, my, change my mind to live for God, that's active. I'm doing that. I'm changing my mind and deciding to live for God. When I confess his name as Lord, that's active. I'm going to confess him. But when I am baptized, that's passive. I'm baptized into Christ by someone else. And then God does the operating at that point. God does the heart surgery. You know, Brother Jim Merle was mentioned this morning. He finally got himself a heart, and we're so thankful that he did and that he's doing as well as he is. But God performs spiritual heart transplants on a daily basis. He never fails. That's done inwardly. You know, in John 3, th 3 through 5, well, before we get to that, I forgot. <laughs> I, I found this picture of, of a couple of chewed up pencils, and I was thinking about this. You know, you can, you can have pencils that look like these poor pitiful things, but it doesn't matter because what's important is what's on the inside. You can take an old chewed up pencil and sharpen it, and guess what? You can use that thing. It, it may not look pretty, but you can use it because what's important is what's on the inside. Our society today gets so hung up on outward appearance. Well, you're, you're too fat. You're too skinny. You're, you're too tall. You're too short. Too ugly. You know, whatever. But God says he's concerned with what's on the inside. John 3, 3 to 5, you know, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, of course, asked the question, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Sometimes people will say, Do you believe that a person must be baptized in order to go to heaven, Chad? And I say, well, my answer to that is, well, I believe what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that, so yes, I do believe that. And I've heard of people making scoffing comments like, oh, you know, well, I don't see any sins floating in the water when somebody's baptized. So, you know, and that's meant to be kind of a sarcastic joke. Well, first of all, I could just as easily say to somebody, if you advocate the sinner's prayer, I don't see any sins floating away when somebody says the sinner's prayer. But my point is this, you're not going to see sins floating in the baptistry because that is an inward change. That is something that God is doing inwardly, taking away sin, blotting out sin, washing it away by the blood of Jesus Christ when it's applied to my heart. The most important part of you, just like a pencil, will always, always be what's on the inside. I would especially like to emphasize that to our young folks and especially the young ladies because our society today has got that so mixed up and some of our young folks have such a messed up worldview because they're so hung up on what outside looks look like. But the most important part of you is, is what's on the inside. What does your spirit look like? That's what God is looking at. And that's what's going to matter on the day of judgment. Well, let's notice, fifth, I believe it is, on every surface you're used, you must leave your mark. Well, if you have children or if you've had children before, this right here is probably a familiar scene to you at least the results of it perhaps. Maybe you didn't catch them in the act. I've never been able to catch one in the act. But uh, we, one of our children, I, I, he'll remain nameless, but he was famous for uh, just not too terribly long ago leaving an L and an E. That's about all he could get. And he just was learning to do some letters. He'd get an L and an E. And I, I didn't do that. I, look, I did not do that. Well, you know, there's two choices. I mean, you know, baby sister was too little. So this, it, it's, it's L, E, or J, O. And, you know, unless, unless Big Brother's gotten smart enough at that age to, to frame you, well, it's pretty obvious. But, you know, we've all been there, most of us, if, we, if you have children or have had children in your house. And I, I don't know, that kid may be drawn on a board, I, but you know what I'm talking about. Kids riding on the wall. But 
a pencil is no good if it doesn't leave a mark. I mean, what, what do you, you know, you may be sitting there saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take notes. Well, if you're not making a mark on the surface, it's pointless. We need to leave our mark. Romans 14, 7 and 8, Paul says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. You ever heard the expression, no man is an island? We have influence. Every day, we are influencing somebody. And it's amazing because sometimes you don't even know who you're influencing until sometimes years down the road, and sometimes we never know what kind of influence we have over somebody. And so I need to guard that. He goes on and says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And so leave your mark, leave his mark, more particularly, on this world. I want to make sure that I leave my mark, the Lord's mark, on every surface. 1 Thessalonians 5.10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Galatians 2.20, most of us know this verse. This is, this is one I mentioned this morning. It's hard to quote it without thinking of the song and without singing the song. But he says, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I'm crucified and yet I live. How is that, Paul? Well, I live by the faith, the gospel, the system of faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he says, I die daily, dying to self, dying to sin, crucifying the old man, we sometimes say, and I'm trying to live for God and leave his mark on this earth. Acts 4, 13, we, we noticed this not too long ago in our Bible class. They took knowledge of them, the latter part of that verse says, the Jews took knowledge of Peter and John that they had been with Jesus. How often does the world look at you and look at me and take knowledge of us that we've been with Jesus? Am I leaving his mark on this world? I love the words of Jude 22 and 23 where Jude says, Of, of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You'll never be, be able to leave a better mark <clears throat> on this world than when you help a soul go from a state of being lost to a state of being saved. Never a better mark that anyone could leave on this old earth than that. 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, Peter talks about wives leaving a godly mark on their husbands. He says, Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation, the behavior of the wives. He says, wives, if you have a husband who's not a Christian, or maybe he's not faithful, you behave as you ought, and that'll leave a mark. While they behold your chaste conversation or behavior coupled with fear. Leaving a mark. He says, wives can leave a mark and many times even lead their husbands to Christ without preaching to them or preaching at them, as we sometimes say. But by setting that godly example and taking occasion, taking opportunity when you can to talk to him, but leaving a mark, in other words. Just like a pencil on every surface, I want to be sure I leave not just my mark, but the Lord's mark. Leave a mark so that people know I've been with Jesus. And then finally, just like with the pencil, no matter what the condition, you must continue to write. You've got to continue writing. Don't stop. Don't give up, we sometimes say. And I think I've shown this picture before, but it's just a perfect illustration of what we're talking about here. You know, here's, here's a frog. He's getting, he's getting swallowed up and eat up, but he's not going down without a fight. You know, life is tough sometimes. It'll beat us down. It'll discourage us. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's circumstances. Sometimes it's events. But we're admonished time and time again through Scripture. Don't ever give up. You know Revelation 2.10, the last part of that verse, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Hang in there, Jesus says. Be faithful and it'll be worth it. 1 Corinthians 15.58 as he's concluding this wonderful discourse on the resurrection. Paul says, wherefore, he's, he's summing it up, wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
It's not always easy, but as we say, it will always be, always has been, always will be worth it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, James 1.12, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And as we often remind everybody, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14.15. So it's not enough just to say, I love the Lord. If I truly love him, I'm striving every day to do what he would have me to do, to be what he would have me to be. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, just like the pencil, if we remember these things, we'll be the best person that we can possibly be. Just by way of reminder, the points are, remember that you'll be able to do great things, but only if you place yourself in the master's hands. You'll experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you need that to become a better person. You'll be able to correct any mistakes that you might make. Four, the most important part of you will always be what is on the inside. And five, on every surface you're used, you must leave your mark. And then as we just noticed, no matter the circumstances, don't give up, just keep on keeping on. Maybe that you're not a Christian tonight and you need to correct some mistakes by applying the blood of Christ to your soul. You may need to come confessing him as Lord, turning away from sin, being buried in that watery grave, raised to walk in newness of life, having the blood of Christ applied to erase all sin in your life. Might be as a child of God, you need to apply that spiritual eraser of 1 John 1, <coughs> verse 9, confessing sins so that he will be faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We remember these points, young, old, in between. They will help us to be the best person we can possibly be, to be the best servant of God that you can possibly be. Heaven's invitation is open. If you need to make use of God's spiritual eraser, won't you do it now? Won't you come when we stand and sing?
Sister Morgan Presley has come and certainly a, a good example for us and we appreciate her heart. She has said that uh, she's allowed friends to influence her more to do things and say things and act in ways that she should not and when she knows that she ought to be influencing them and uh, says so she's, she's also facing a choice of uh, maybe having, you know, possibly having to let some friends go uh, due to that fact, but she acknowledges that she's made some bad choices and she's let, <clears throat> let a worldly influence creep in. She wants to make that right, and we, we appreciate uh, the, the great heart, the great example that Morgan has shown tonight in having the integrity and the, the courage to say, hey, I've, I've made a mistake, and I want to make that right. And she wants our prayers for her to make the right choices, to do the right things, and to be the example that she needs to be. And so we appreciate her for that. Brother Jimmy, uh, would you mind coming and leading us in a word of prayer on her behalf? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for thy word and the power that it has. We're thankful for our young people, especially our sister Morgan. We pray, Father, as she has come confessing these wrongs within her life, we know that you have forgiven her and may as we as thy servants <coughs> help build her up, strengthen her. Father, we're so thankful for thy word and the ability that we have to have forgiveness when we fail thee. Father, we know this world of evil is influencing us each and every day. May we battle back the best we can, using thy word each day. Father, may we choose those to be round about us that will strengthen us in these efforts, that will help us get to heaven, help us to do these things, and always put thee first. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We're thankful to Chad for those fine lessons today, for all others at a public part in our worship service, for those that are visiting, your honored guests. We're so glad that you've decided to be here. Please take a moment. If you were not here this morning, fill out an attendance card and leave that on the table in the foyer. Give to one of us before you depart so that we may have a record of your visit. I remind you of those that we mentioned this morning. Uh, you're again asked to continue to remember the mural family as Brother Jim is continuing at UAB and he'll most likely be there for some time. And if you would like to help with that project concerning financial donation, please see Karen or Jamie today. Again, we extend our sympathy to the family of Joyce Presley, and the, whose uh, brother's great-grandchild, uh, an infant child, passed away last week. Are there others that we should mention? For those Bible school teachers in spring quarter that's uh, uh, completing today, we would like to ask you to get your perfect attendance records into Jimmy or Jan as soon as possible. Brothers Keepers Group 3, Jake and Julie's group, will meet uh, next Saturday, June the 1st, 6 p.m. at the home of Eric and Mary. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Group 2, Ricky and Cindy's group, meets Sunday, June the 9th at the home of the Glovers. Sign-up sheet in the foyer. Summer potluck after the evening service next Sunday, which will be the kickoff of our summer quarter already. And hopefully we would ask you to consult your bulletin if you have yet. The summer series schedule has been published in our bulletin. We're really excited about our summer series. Again, the theme is why I'm a member of the Church of Christ, right? And there we have uh, actually live speakers for each of those events, and we're very excited about that. So if you have yet to uh, see who's coming and what their topics are going to be and when they're going to be here, grab a bulletin before you leave so that you have that. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it in your iPad or whatever so that you know who's coming when and you'll be certainly blessed to participate in those events. That summer series will begin the first Wednesday of June. Concerning that potluck next Sunday after the evening service, groups three and four asked to set up, make the tea and coffee and so forth, and groups one and two will be asked to tidy up after the event. Ladies, Devo and lunch, uh, Thursday, June the 6th, 11 a.m., will be the beginning of that event. Camp in Agahe will be uh, June 16th through 22, Bremen's Week. If you have yet to register, time is slipping away, so please do that as soon as possible. Johnny will make himself available after services tonight to answer any questions that you may have or provide any assistance in registration. 
VBS is also upcoming. It's the third week of July, is that right? Sometime in July, third week, I believe. Two classes uh, for ages, I beg your pardon, two teachers per class for ages two through fifth grade. If you have yet to volunteer for that, please do so at your earliest convenience, see Jimmy or Jan, so that we can get that taken care of. Current elders, deacons, ministers, servant-hearted saints, please put this on your calendar Saturday, June the 22nd. Our brethren at Lithia Springs are, hope, are hosting a seminar, Dynamic Deacons, a seminar for elders, deacons, ministers, and servant-hearted saints. The one who will be administering that is um, Brother Johnson from Peachtree City, and he is very accomplished as an author and a speaker, so we'll certainly encourage you to put that on your calendar. Hopefully several of us can go as a group and uh, participate in that event Saturday, June the 22nd. Lithia Springs has also volunteered to have the next area-wide singing, which is slated for Friday, June the 28th. So June, again, as has been May, a very busy month upcoming. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. We hope to see each other at our next appointed time, which is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Should we mention anything else? Final song, brother. 681. 681 will be at our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. thankful unto thee for the opportunity we've had today to come out and hear thy word proclaimed. We thank thee for Morgan Presley and we thank thee for the example that she set. We pray, Father, that you be with those that are sick, those that are afflicted, watch over and keep them, be with the medical staff that try to comfort them. Father, we're mindful of those men and women in the military. We're thankful for their service. We pray, Father, that you would be with them and keep them safe. Forgive us of our sins. Watch over and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.